Thank you. Thanks for the organization. Uh, so everything we're going to talk about today is going to be based on joint works with Pietro Caputo, Fabio Martinelli, and Adi Sinclair, all present here in the audience. And then we're going to talk about this object called random lattice triangulations, which I find it quite fascinating object with very interesting properties. So let me start defining you what a lattice triangulation is. So I take the 0n by 0n square and take all points of Z2 inside this square. And I consider these points as just a point set. And I'm going to take a triangulation of this point set, which can be easily constructed by just adding edges one by one with the property that the edges have endpoints in this point set and contain no other point of the point set. And two edges can only intersect at the endpoints. And you keep doing this until you cannot add edges anymore. And you are left with a picture like this, where all faces of your picture are triangles. That's why you call it triangulations, except from, for the external face. And it's also the case that the convex hull of a point set, which in this case is the boundary of the n by n square, is always present uh, in your triangulation. So that, that's the object I call uh, lattice triangulation. One simple and well-known fact is that, oh, first, that's not the only one, only uh, lattice triangulation of the n by n box. There are many of them, and one special uh, type of triangulation I would like you to keep in mind. It is very simple triangulations where you have all the one by one squares present in your, in your triangulation and have this choice of unidiagonals. You can either put this one or this one for each of the one by one squares. And this set of triangulations I'm going to refer to as ground state triangulations just because they are, as a reference for triangulations, that we have the smallest possible size for the edges. So that will be, I'll refer to that particular set of triangulations later again. So one simple uh, property that is well known is that any triangulation you take of the end by end box has the same number of edges and the same number of face, and these numbers are well known and they have order n square. So just keep in mind that the size of our instance of the problem is n square and not n. Okay. So that's a, a lattice triangulation. And this problem, this, this object has been uh, looked at in um, many different areas, especially in combinatorics. And a lot of people call combinatorics is interesting counting how many such triangulations are there. Or at least get an asymptotic for the number of triangulations of the end by end box. And despite many efforts, this, this is not known. So no one knows exactly, there's no explicit formula for the number of lattice triangulations and not even asymptotics, the right asymptotics are known. And this is in contrast with other types of triangulations you may have uh, run into, like triangulations of points in a convex position, uh, triangulations of a convex polygon. The number of such triangulations are well known, they're given by Catalan numbers. And also triangulations from, coming from the theory of random maps, which are triangulations of, of the surface of the sphere triangulation of the sphere with exactly any vertices, and if you look at the set of all such triangulations, also the number of such triangulations, there are explicit formulas for these things, and uh, this helps a lot in analyzing this kind of objects, but such formulas, such asymptotics are not available at the moment for lattice triangulations. And, but one thing that we know is that there are exponentially many uh, such objects, exponentially in n square. And this is easy to see from this picture because we have two choices for each of the unit diagonals here. So there are at least two to the n square. And the best bounds that are known are these two. So there is a lower bound that's exponential in 1.42 n square due to Kybert Seeger. And there is an upper bound that's exponential is 1.93 n square due to Matuszek, Wout, and Veltz. And as you see, these bounds are off by an exponential factor of one another. So this, and these bonds has already, have already been obtained with quite involved and fine uh, studies of these properties, of this process. But the right answer is still uh, not known and far from rich. So that's, <coughs> that's about counting. Let me 
I'll just mention some basic properties of these lattice triangulations. If it's the first time you see this object, these pro this properties may sound quite uh, you know, surprising. And one property is no matter which triangulation you take, all triangles have the same area. And all triangles have area half. And no matter the triangle, it can be this very simple triangle here or a very long triangle here, they all have the same area half in any lattice triangulation. And this is known as Pick's theorem. And this is a property that says that any triangle whose endpoints are integers and that contain no other point uh, inside the triangle or in the edge of the triangle has an uh, area half. Okay. So this means that if you end up finding a very long edge in your triangulation, like this one, then necessarily the triangle contained that must, must be very thin. Right? The height of the triangle must be small so that the area is a half. Another interesting property that's also going to be useful for us is the following. So I'd like you to consider the set of midpoints of the edge. So take any edge, for them this edge here, and it's easy to figure out that the midpoint of this edge is somewhere around here. If you take a longer edge, it may be a bit more difficult to visualize where the midpoint is, but you can, you can do it. And as an exercise, you could try to picture in your mind the midpoint of the set of midpoints of all the edges. Just try to put to see each edge and draw a dot at the midpoint of that edge and try to visualize this set. It may sound a bit strange question for me to ask you to do, but the fact is this set is very easy to define, very easy to see, and that's the set of midpoints. Uh, it's very structured. In particular, this set does not depend on the triangulation. If I change the triangulation, you have the same set of midpoints. And the set of midpoints is just described by this set, which is the set of points on the plane for which the coordinates are either integer or half integer. But both coordinates cannot be integer. Right? That's, those are, are points of a point set. And it's easy to see that any edge of a triangulation, of a lattice triangulation, must have midpoint in this set because the endpoints of the edge are integer points. So the, no. the midpoint better be a half integer. And to see that the opposite, that any such, for any triangulation and any such midpoint, you find an edge with that midpoint to just count the number of points in this set. And you see that it matches exactly the number of internal edges in your triangulation. So just a counting argument. So that's a, a very interesting property because it allows you to look at triangulations using the language of spin systems, where your spin system is a set of vertices of your spin system. It's just a set of midpoints, these red uh, points. And now you see a triangulation sigma as a collection of values sigma x, where x ranges over midpoints. And sigma x denotes the spin of the midpoint x, and it's the edge of sigma whose midpoint is x. Okay, so we can see uh, a lot of strangulation as a spin system using this language. Uh, of course, there are some challenges with trying to use known techniques for analyzing spin systems to the, the lattice triangulation. The, some of the challenges are that, first, there are unbounded many spins for each midpoint, especially midpoints away from the corners of the, of the box, of the n by n box. So there can be or the n possible spins for, for one given uh, midpoint. And another, another important, even more striking Challenge is that there are many non-local interactions uh, going on with the lattice triangulations. For example, if you take a triangle, a very long triangle like this one, this green one, of course the edges of the triangle interact with one another. They, they impose hardcore constraints on the triangulation. And even though the midpoint of these two edges are here around the middle, the midpoint of another edge of the triangle could be very far away. So it is, this can have arbitrarily large uh, dependence and hardcore constraints on your triangulations. And even worse than that is that this, this interaction depends on the triangulation. 
It differs from traditional spin systems where you have usually have a Hamiltonian that defines which uh, which spin interacts directly with which other spins with neighbors. But in this case, no, the interaction actually depends on the on the triangulation. This makes uh, makes it quite challenging to use some uh, non techniques for analyzing uh, lattice triangulations. So that's uh, is the properties I, I would like to mention. Uh, so what I'm going to look at now, I'm going to look at random such objects, and I'm going to introduce the following uh, measure on lattice triangulation. I'm going to just write here for simplicity. So for each triangulation sigma, we're going to have a measure mu of sigma, which is, there is a normalizing constant to make it a probability measure. Then you have the sum, oh, done the sum. I have a parameter lambda to the sum over all midpoints x of the size of the edge of sigma whose midpoint is x. So this quantity here is just the sum of the length of the edges of your triangulation, so the total edge length of your triangulation. And to introduce a probability measure mu of sigma, which is proportional to lambda, this parameter lambda that's some positive parameter, to the total edge length of a triangulation. And just for concreteness, I'll take the length of an edge to be the L1 length. It's just convenient in, in this case. Okay. So we clearly see that there are three cases for lambda that you can meet immediately spot. If lambda is more than one, your triangulation will prefer short edge. If lambda is bigger than one, you're going to prefer long edge. And if lambda is equal to one, then you have uniformly random uh, triangulation. So that's the, the probability measure we're going to look at. And you're going to define a Markov chain over lattice triangulations uh, that given a lattice triangulation there on the left, the Markov chain has transitions as follow. You're going to pick an edge, an internal edge, uniform at random, which means you just pick a midpoint, uniform at random. For example, that red one there. And then you, this, mid, this edge must be a diagonal of a quadrilateral, so there's two triangles that contain the edge. If this quadrilateral is strictly convex, then you can replace, remove this edge, and add the opposite diagonal, and you get a valid triangulation. And you do that with probability proportional to the condition probability of having this edge given all the other edges are present and fixed. So you just do Galba dynamics or hit bath dynamics. On, on this. But if you end up choosing an edge that is a diagonal of a quadrilateral that is not strictly convex, like in this case, then you cannot remove this edge and you know, add the other diagonal because it would not create a valid triangulation. So in this case, you just uh, don't do anything and suppress the, the, the move, just stay put. Okay. So that's your Markov chain. And the only thing you need to show in order to show that this Markov chain converts to the, the measure I just introduced, is you have to show that the Markov chain is irreducible. So you have to show that between any two triangulations, I can transform one triangulation into the other by just performing these uh, flip operations. Okay. And this is, of course, not completely trivial, but the, the property that you need is the following. If you want to transform, the problem is the following. If you want to transform one triangulation into another triangulation, what you do is you take one triangulation and look at the longest edge of that triangulation. So the longest edge must always be flippable. And the reason is you know, the, the quadrilaterals, the, the edge in the quadrilaterals uh, around this edge cannot be larger than the size of the edge itself because that edge is the longest. So it, it necessarily means that this, this quadrilateral, which I forgot to say, but if an edge is flippable, this quadrilateral must actually be a parallelogram, not only strictly convex, but a parallelogram. In this case, uh, we have that this is uh, this parallelogram is strictly. Uh, you have this parallelogram; it's strictly convex, so we can actually flip the longest edge, since all the other edges of the quadrilateral are not larger than that edge. So it has to be a strictly convex quadrilateral. The other properties you need is that not only that the longest edge is flippable, but it can only occur two possible cases: either the longest edge is of this form, is a unidiagonal, which means we are back to this ground state set of quadrilaterals where 
we have all the units squares and the unit diagonals in the whole picture that I showed in the beginning. Or if you're not, you're not in this situation, if you have a longest edge that's not a unit diagonal, what happens is this edge is flippable and it strictly decreases in size after flipping it. Okay. So in order to create a path between two triangulations, just take the longest edge of one triangulation, flip it, look at the new longest edge, flip it, and keep it doing that. Eventually, since you, at each step you decrease the size of the edge strictly, you eventually get to a ground state triangulation. You do the same with the other triangulation. And once both are reduced to ground state triangulation, you can just flip unit diagonals and match them up. So we have a path between uh, any, two, any two triangulations in this case. Okay, so that's, that's the, the object we want to look at. There are many interesting questions one could ask about this, this Markov chain or this object. Our main interest in studying this object was to look at the mixing time of this Galba dynamics. And the main reason is that it already appears uh, in the papers by the, the people from combinatorics, by Kybert Seeger. They suggest look at the mixing time of this global dynamics as a strategy, in the case of lambda equals one, the case of uniformly random triangulations, as a strategy to come up with a polynomial time algorithm to approximate the number of triangulations. But by, we, we, we see that the the mixing time is interesting when to look if, even for all the values of lambda, actually this triangulation shows quite, uh, this large triangulation shows quite interesting behaviors for many, for different values of lambda. But of course, there are many other questions you could ask besides mixing time, like the, what's the typical length of an edge, of a given edge, whether there are decay of correlations, um, and all the other questions. I'll not just, I'll not uh, say much about this, let me just, uh, give you an idea how this object behaves. So let me open this. Okay. So this is this is a 50 by 50 triangulation, and Toshiba is complaining. Okay. That's a 50 by 50 triangulation. Uh, now I think it's complaining now. Okay, there's a 50 by 50 triangulation. Just take an arbitrary one, and now I'm gonna start. Now you have to find the panda. <laughs> <laughs> if you do, let me know. And now you, now I'm going to run the Markov chain with lambda equals to 0 0.9. So the Markov chain is running, uh, doing this flip dynamics, this global dynamics I just told you. And lambda here is 0.9, so that we are favoring short edges. And what you can observe is that Every now and then, some longish edge shows up, just because there are so many possibilities, something started growing a bit. And these are the regions that get a bit darker, because this edge, you know, the longer the edge is, the thinner the triangle is, so they have more edges close to the, one another, so you get darker uh, images in your, in your simulation. But if you focus your eye in one region, for example here, and you just wait a bit, you see that even if some longish edge shows up, it washes away very quickly. So it suggests that the Markov chain should be fast mixing. And, that, and also if you look at diff regions on your, on your simulation that are far away, you suspect from the simulation that they evolve roughly independent, they don't affect one another much, so we'd expect decay of correlations and, and all such uh, nice properties. But it's... Yeah, I have to tell you that actually all this is open for n by n triangulations and uh, for n for in the general case of just assuming lambda is more than one. And in our f in our first paper in this in this topic, what we show is that if you take lambda is small enough, then for lambda is small enough, you can for all lambda is small enough, you can show uh, that the mixing time is fast. Actually, the mixing time is as fast as the diameter of the chain, so it can't be faster than that. And we can show decay of correlations, we can show uniqueness of the, of the Gibbs measure, we can show many, many properties for lambda uh, sufficiently small. But we believe this should all hold for all lambda is more than one, but this is still open. So now let me take this, this 
picture and change the value of lambda for you. So I'm going to put lambda equals to 1.1, and then we we'll let the Markov chain run a bit. And now we're going to see that the picture gets much different than before. In particular, you know, lambda is bigger than 1, so we start favoring longer edge. So, so uh, some long edges will start showing up. The edges around that are kind of aligned to that edge, forced to be aligned. This gives room between them for longer edges to start creeping in and keep going. And this creates a big region of edges that start to get aligned with one another. And of course, but this edge starts growing in different areas of your picture. They, at some moments, you have this big cluster, and they start cra crash with one another. They, they cannot grow anymore, even if they want. So this suggests that the Markov chain starts to get stuck in some configurations. And, and actually, to get this even clearer, if, if that was needed, I can, I can just do the following. I take edge that are oriented in this way. I, I you know, color them with one color. Edge oriented in this way, I color with another color. And they're going to get a picture like this. <laughs> and this blue and red regions, they, the interesting is that the boundary of these regions is always horizontal and vertical lines. So I have this very you know, simple to describe boundary. But you, know, even you would suspect that for lambda bigger than 1, the measure would concentrate on configurations where most of the region is of one color and would find the other color just in some scattered uh, small areas of your n-by-n of your box. But of course, for example, this, this red region will fight a bit hard until it gets convinced to become blue. And the reason is, in order to transform this guy into blue, I have to take all these longish edges, reduce them to the smallest possible size to a unidiagonal, then flip to the other direction, and then let them grow again. And this, of course, costs a lot for the Markov chain to do that, so it's going to take a long time uh, to do that change. So that's uh, the picture for lambda bigger than 1. So we expect that Markov chain will be uh, slowly mixing. We can, have a, we, can, we can give exponential bounds on the Markov chain for this case, for all lambda bigger than 1, but we're still uh, far from the right answer. And not just before continuing with the thought, just erase the colors. And I'm going to set lambda. And now I'm going to do an experiment here. Usually I don't do this, but I'll start with this very you know, clashed and very blocked triangulation. And I'm going to set lambda equals to 1. And then we'll see what happens. <clears throat> and then I'm going to, if you if you look at the simulation for a while, you will see that for lambda equals 1, even if you're not favoring long, short edges, even if the triangles are blocked, but we still see that you slowly is forgetting what the blocking configuration is. And actually, if I had more time for a talk, I could leave this for half an hour. It would be enough for you to see, to completely forget about the, the blocking configuration I had seen before. But, so, but you still have some longish edges, just different ones? Or? You get some longish, apparently longish edge, but they are not, they don't create as rigid regions as in the case of lambda equals one. They show up, but they get washed away after some reasonable time. But would they be sort of as long as the long ones you're seeing now? No, they'll be a bit shorter. So, <clears throat> yeah, so what I can say about this. What we know about this case is nothing. So this, uh, that, that, that's all I have about lambda equals 1. Uh, we don't know anything. We suspect that the mixing time would be given by some polynomial, but not with a larger power than uh, in the case lambda is more than 1. But still some polynomial. So I'm going to just continue with the talk. I'm going to let this running on the background. So, so remember how the blocking configuration <laughs> was. Uh, and then at the end, we can. Uh, we can see what, what, whether we see something from the blocking configuration. Okay. So let me say that our main focus was the mixing time of the global dynamics. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about that problem, because that will show up in the next talk by Fabio. And he'll explain better 
these things. Uh, what I want to concentrate here is, I said that we, our first results was for lambda sufficiently smaller than one, but we expect the same behavior to hold for all lambdas smaller than one, but the techniques we use to prove the results for lambda sufficiently smaller than one, for example, to prove the K of correlations, we, we implement just a careful but standard implementation of a pious argument that already showed uh, the K of correlation for lambda sufficiently small, and you don't expect you know, the pious argument to work all the way to lambda is more than one, so we need to develop new techniques, but you know, lattice triangulations tend to fight hard. They, they don't like you to get results about them. <laughs> and for example, there are many properties that are very useful in eyes of spin system that do not hold for lattice triangulation. For example, FKG does not hold, which quite surprising you would expect that condition of some hedge being small would increase the probability of other edge being small, but you can come up with very easy examples where this fails. So, so what I'm going to explain here is one technique that we know that gives some information about the case of all lambdas more than one. Okay, that's what I'm going to concentrate for the rest of the talk. And this is uh, a construction of a Lyapunov function on lattice triangulations. So the function is a bit involved, so let's go slowly. First, let me generalize the problem. I'm going to look at lattice triangulations with constraint edge, so I'm adding this red edge, and I'm taking now my measure on triangulations condition on this edge being present. And it's, we also know that the Markov chain is still irreducible given any set of constraints. So within this set where the constraints are present, the Markov chain uh, connects any two triangulations within this set by flips. And this this Lyapunov function will be a function uh, you have, you, you can see this function as the following, you take a triangulation, say imagine the triangulation on the floor, and now picture it midpoint on top of the triangulation, and the Lyapunov function will give some height value, some value for each midpoint of your triangulation, and what this Lyapunov function would tell you is that this value, if it grows up too much, this value tends to decrease. But let me, let me explain uh, how the function is defined. So I'm going to take the following. For each midpoint, I'm going to have a value. And let's focus on a midpoint x. And given the constraints I draw in blue, the smallest possible edge whose midpoint is x and satisfies the constraint, does not violate the constraint. So if, if the constraints are not there, the smallest possible edge of midpoint x would be the horizontal edge. But this edge cannot be present for the other constraint edge, the red edge. So the smallest possible edge of midpoint x is this one. Now take this edge. This edge may not belong to your triangulation. You just take this as a reference edge. And then you take all edges of your triangulation sigma that intersect across that edge. So, this is, so I'm just looking at my triangulation. Now I'm just looking at the edges of the triangulation that cross the blue edge. And now your function, the value of the function at the point x will be the sum over those edges, the edges that cross the blue edge, of alpha, it's another parameter I'm introducing, to the power of the size of the edge that cross the blue edge minus the size of the blue edge. So the size of the blue edge is not important, it's just normalization. Important to class summing exponential factors based on the length of each uh, edge that cross the blue edge. And this alpha is going to be a value that's bigger than one, but such that alpha times lambda is smaller than one. So it's bigger than one, but not much. But you can always find such alpha if lambda is strictly smaller than one. Okay. So this gives a value for the midpoint x, and I see this as, as a height. What is sub x term? Sorry? What is the sub x rules for size? What is the x? X is the midpoint that I chose, yeah. So it's for each x, I have a value based on, that, uh, on, on the edge that cross that, the smallest edge, blue edge that has midpoint x. And now, <clears throat> so let me just mention two useful properties of this crossing. This crossing sounds very strange at first, but, but there are some interesting facts about it. The first fact is, 
the larger the value of the function at x kind of indicates how far away the local configuration around x is from the minimum value. So just to take an example, suppose that the blue edge was in the triangulation. This means that no other edge would cross the blue edge besides the blue edge. So this function would be just the blue edge of alpha to the blue edge minus the blue edge, zero, so it would be one. This function is one if, if the blue edge belongs to the triangulation. So if the, the edge at midpoint x is at the minimum value. If the blue edge is not present, then certainly the edge of the triangulation that has midpoint x cross the blue edge. It cross at x. And this edge has size larger than the blue edge, because the blue edge is the smallest possible for that midpoint. So immediately you give a fact that's bigger than one. So in the fact, in the, and every time you take a, your triangulation and you flip an edge in such a way that this edge increases in size, the value of the function can only increase. And the reason is, any time an edge of your triangulation cross the blue edge, if this edge is flippable and you increase its size, it still cross the blue edge. So that's just geometric property, not completely trivial, but, but that's an uh, interesting property of, this, of these crossings. So that that's give you an intuition of why the, this function uh, is, is useful. And let me just state the, the theorem for this Lyapunov function. So the theorem is the following. So if for any lambda is more than one, you can find an alpha bigger than one, such that this function is a Lyapunov function for every x. And this means that there exists a constant c depending only on lambda, such that for all triangulation sigma, for all midpoint x, if the function at x is bigger than c, then after one step of the Markov chain, the expected value of the function decreases. So this means that if you again go back to the picture of the triangulation you know, printed on the floor, and this, the value of the function for each x being some height function on top of this picture, whenever a point gets above the value c, it has a drift down. So it behaves as a super martingale. So this means that this function point-wise tends to be close to, to c at least. So that's, that's the, the, the main fact. And since, it, I mean, at least in a high level picture, the value of the function, the larger the value, kind of indicates that the configuration is no, further away from the local configuration, the minimum possible local configuration on that midpoint, it tells you that the configuration point-wise tends to be close to the minimum. That's what it indicates. So my goal here is that I want to tell you two things about this function. Uh, the first thing uh, is why the exponential form, why it's useful. And the second thing I want to tell you is just one idea one ingredient on how to prove that it's actually up in our function. Okay, let me just, ah, and one important thing, so for application, it's very important that actually this Lyapunov function works for any set of constraints. Arbitrarily, constraints can be as large as you want, as strange as you want, it works. Still a Lyapunov function. And also it works for triangulation of not only the end by any box, but of any shape. Could be, instead of square, it could be the rectangle, it could be a trapezoid, it could be any lattice polygon, even non-convex, and the function still works as a Lyapunov function. It's still a Lyapunov function. So it's robust uh, in this sense, and it actually this is quite important for applications. So let me just quickly tell you why the exponential form. That's, and this is to solve one problem, to take care of one problem of lattice triangulation, is that an edge like this one that can be flipped, and if flipped, it increases in size, can increase to arbitrary large values. For example, in this case, this edge has length one and increased to very large length. And this length could be arbitrary large by taking these two endpoints and putting as far away as you want. Could be of order n. So can, can, uh, an edge can go from size one to size of order n in one flip. Of course, you pay exponential price to, to do this flip. But no, it would increase a lot the value of the function if, in, if, if the flip happens. And the, the nice property is the following. Let me just 
quickly go through this, is that just look at the contribution, the expected contribution of an edge. So suppose we have this edge, which is flippable, and it increases if flipped. Okay? And we want to compare the expected value. We want to look at the expected contribution of this edge. Well, just look at alpha to the length of this edge, just to simplify, forget about the sum and everything. Just look at alpha to the side of this edge, and how this value changes. How the, what's the expected value of this after a possible flip? And the, the important thing is that if you look, if you say that E and F are the length of the edges of the parallelogram surrounding the, the red, the green edge, then the side of this edge is exactly F times E in L1 norm. And if you flip it, it becomes F plus E. So if you write down the expected value of the edge, you just get you know, alpha to the F minus E times the probability that you don't flip, alpha to the F plus E times the probability that you flip. And if you factor out uh, lambda to F minus E, and not just go quickly, what you get is a, this term, and this term should stare for one minute just. You have alpha to the F minus E. F minus E is just the value of the edge you had before the flip. Then you have a term here that's 1 plus lambda to 2E. Lambda is more than 1. And 2E is the amount the edge changed in size. It could be very large, but the larger it is, the closer it is to 1. So it doesn't harm you. And you have this other term that has an alpha lambda to 2E, but you are setting alpha to be small so that alpha lambda is more than 1. So this also doesn't harm you. So it, what it says is that this function up to constants is just alpha to the f minus e. It only depends on the value of the edge before flipping. So it doesn't matter for how big the edge becomes. This, this function absorbs the impact of this, this, this change. Uh, and, and it allows you to control uh, this, this strange case. So that's why uh, one reason why this alpha to the size of the edge is kind of handy. The other thing I want to say is, is how to prove that this function uh, is a Lyapunov function. Let me just, before doing that, let me just uh, mention a much simpler function you could, you could come up with. You don't need, we can just, for example, drop the sum, and you could try to think whether I can just say that the value of the function at x is just alpha to the size of x. You could just ask yourself, why can't I just take the function in the simpler form? And the reason is, of course, this function would not be pointwise a super martingale if it gets bigger than c, because edge that are increasing in size, that can be flipped and increase, can only increase the value of the function. So if x was a midpoint whose edge, sigma x, is increasing, so this at that point, no matter how large the function is, it would increase in expectation. It would increase the it will never decrease at that point, unless you change the triangulation, make that edge uh, decreasing. So that's, this, this is to tell you that you need some sort of averaging in order to allow that for each midpoint, the value of the function behaves as super martingale, point-wise. And, 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 we were like, and that's why we're introducing these this crossings in order to, as a way to come up with this uh, averaging. Let me just, uh, that's the last slide of technical things. I just want to tell you why, one reason why this function behaves as, or oh, one ingredient on how to prove this function behaves uh, as a super martingale. And it's a nice partition on the on a triangulation. So I'm going to partition the triangles of a triangulation as following for any triangle, for example, this one here. You just, I'm going to just traverse the triangles, and I traverse along the largest edge of the triangle. So for this triangle, I go to this triangle. From this triangle, I go to this triangle, and keep going until I cross this orange edge. And when I cross the orange edge, I go back, right? Because that's the largest edge of the two triangles. And at the moment, I stop. And each edge that gets mapped to the orange edge becomes the part of the partition centered at this orange edge. So what, and this partitions your triangles into sets. And one interesting thing is that if you look at this orange edge, it's always a decreasing edge. Edge that you, if you flip, you decrease it. Because it has to be an edge that's the largest in both triangles containing it. So it has to be decreasing. 
So all decreasing edges are, as I call, centers of these partitions. And another nice property is that all increasing edges are at the boundary. Because increasing edges are edges that are not the largest in both triangles. So each of these triangles must be mapped to different uh, uh, edges. So that's, that's, uh, that's a quite useful partition because now if you want to do your function centered at a midpoint here, and this blue line is just the smallest edge whose midpoint is that, and you want to look at all edges that cross this blue edge, then if you look at the black edge, this edge is increasing. And it's a geometric fact that if this edge is increasing, the two centers of the partition that you know, contain the target edges in the boundary also cross the blue edge. So that, that fact is, is very useful in the proof because it says that for any increasing edge that cross the blue edge, I can find two decreasing edges that also cross, and these two decreasing edges are larger than the increasing edge. Necessarily larger because the way I construct, you always cross the largest edge of a triangle, so you end up in the largest edge of your partition. So this allows you to say, OK, but if this edge increases, it increases the value of the function at this point, but I have two edges that are even larger and have a bigger effect on the Lyapunov function, and that are you know, also uh, waiting to be decreased, let's say. So that's how the, the, the analysis would go, is just to look at the edges that increase, associate with the edges that decrease and are centers of partitions, and you know, using many other things, you can establish the, the result that this, this um, function is, behaves as a Lyapunov function. Just to conclude, I have just the last slide, just want to say some quick consequence of this. So this, this Lyapunov functions you can use to show, for example, that edges have exponential tail. So if you look at the stationary measure, if you fix at a midpoint x and look what's the size, what's the probability that that edge at the midpoint x is bigger than the minimum possible value plus some l, decays exponentially in l. Not only this works for the stationary measure, but also works for the measure induced by the Markov chain if you let the Markov chain run for long enough time. So I would like to say that the, the Lyapunov function implies that we have a conversions of local measures in the sense that if I look at the fix square of some fixed size in the middle of your n by n square, and I look at all the edges that intersect this square, and I let n goes to infinity, I would like to say that this Lyapunov function implies that this, the measure on this small box converts, but that's, we are not yet able to prove that, but at least we are able to prove tightness of, local, of this measure. So th we know that at least subsequential limits exist. But we don't know the at least we cannot prove that they are unique. There is only one. Another thing that we can show is that if you give me any set of constraint edge, arbitrarily large, as strange as you want, and you give me a midpoint that's not part of the constraint, the Lyapunov function implies that the probability that according to the stationary measure, given the set of constraint, that that edge is in its really minimal value is bounded below, bounded away from zero. So this C depends only on, on lambda. That's also a quite useful fact. And also there are some structural properties you can get from last triangulations. For example, you can get that there are top to bottom crossings of your end by end box composed of paths of small triangles. Triangles of all edges are smaller than some given constant depending on, on, on lambda. But unfortunately, it gives a lot of things, but it doesn't, uh, it's not yet enough to prove decay of correlations and mixing time results. In some more particular case, for example, if you don't look at n by n box, but n by k box, where k is fixed, and you just let n go to infinity, keeping k fixed, then you can prove much more. But this uh, will be the topic of the next talk, so I'll just uh, stop here. Thanks. Boundaries is always a rather ugly. Have you looked at um, making a torus out of it so you get rid of the edges? I mean, certainly with lambda less than one, it shouldn't look terribly different. Yes, yeah, it could look rather nice.
You can you can you can wrap around many times, yeah. right? And, and I think it looks like the structure stays. Uh, for lambda bigger than one. Well, in any I case, mean, I mean, for lambda, no. for lambda smaller than one, I agree. But for lambda bigger than one, is very strange because this edge will be able to keep growing indefinitely. Sure. And yeah, so I think you know, lambda less than one, you yeah. probably find yourself in familiar territory. Mm -hmm. Greater than one, you might get something bizarre. How many games have people been able to count the, count the number of triangulations? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, for n by n, uh, okay, I don't remember exactly, but in the, in the paper where there is a lower bound, the Kybert Sigur, they have some. Computation for for counting for for some values of n, and I don't believe it gets much. It doesn't get larger than seven. Seven. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's exponential to the n square. So it's. Mm, I think it's even less than seven. But 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 yes, it's, I won't commit to that answer. So you mentioned that the result uh, of your the up and up function it, it holds for any lattice. It, it holds, no, no, uh, it holds for, if you take the two and you take any polygon whose endpoints are vertices of the two, can be even non-convex, and, and then it, you take a triangulation of the points that are inside this, this polygon, then, then it holds. Yes. But no, not for any lattice, for any lattice would lose many of these properties. You have to prove that by the properties about midpoints, it still holds, but Can we see the results of your beautiful answer? Yes, I was waiting for someone to ask. I can feel myself starting to yes. get a few of the answers. Yes. <laughs> and? There used to be a big block along yes. the way. Yes. That's it. So it's... Uh, <laughs> it took less than an hour, so it just looks like there are some long edges, but it doesn't resemble much anymore the structure we start with. It doesn't look so different from the point nine, right? It does. Look at this configuration. Right? You don't see these kind of things in point nine. Do you want to change? <laughs> point nine? Everything is point nine. Right. I think we should thank the speaker again.